All right, is everyone ready for the jury? Yes, sir. Let's bring him back, please. Please be seated. And is there one a legal pad left on the banister? Is that someone's? She is. Excellent. Oh, that's oh. Okay, gotcha. All right, Mr. Griffith, you may proceed. You may please the court, members of the prosecution, members of the jury. Well, here we are at closing arguments. This case, the prosecution of Donald Hartung, has been, for you, a three-week journey. Hopefully not too unpleasant, hopefully fairly informative. For Donald, it's been a five-year nightmare. Not only has he had his family, his mother, his brother John, and his brother Richard, or RT as he's known, taken from him in the most vicious and vile manner with unbelievable brutality, but he has never, ever been able to fully grieve for his family. Because within an hour of Investigator Enfinger showing up on the scene after the bodies were discovered, he was accused of being a murderer and has been haunted by that accusation for the last five years. Ms. Jensen has done a formidable job in her, the first part of her closing statement, as she did in her opening statement. Or I guess it's closing argument, really, because we're arguing to you what our belief of the facts are. I am going to do my best to stick to the facts that you've heard from the witness stand and the pieces of evidence that have been introduced. There's a lot of fact that Ms. Jensen gave you. There's a lot of fantasy. There's a lot of fantasy in what she said. She wants you to assume things that are not in evidence. And when the judge gives you his closing argument, he's going to tell you it's to the evidence that you heard in this case and to that evidence alone that are you, you are to base your decision. Your verdict is from the evidence, not a flight of fantasy that you may hear from this podium right here. For instance, Ms. Jensen said, well, Donald turned off the TVs. There's no evidence to that. Every one of you has been taking notes through the entire case. And it appeared to me you've been taking copious notes. Review your notes and see if anywhere any witness or anyone else told you that there was any evidence that Donald Hartung turned off the TV. Were his fingerprints on the television? Were his fingerprints on the clicker for the TV? There's no evidence of that. So what I'm asking you to do, when you go back to the jury room to begin your deliberations, I want you to separate the fact from fiction. This is not a crime novel, a mystery novel. This is real life. You're a real jury, and you have taken an oath to render a verdict based on the evidence you hear in this courtroom. No one is asking you to give up your common sense, but we're also at not suggesting that you should go off in flights of fantasy. Now, Donald was accused by Matt Enfinger, the lead homicide investigator of this case, within an hour of Matt Enfinger taking this case as his own, that he decided Donald was the murderer. He looked nowhere else for a murderer. He didn't follow up any other leads. He didn't pursue anything. He latched on to Donald, and from there on, it was Katie bar the door. Every bit of evidence was going to involve Donald. We weren't going to follow up any of this other DNA. That was it. Donald was the subject, and we're going to make sure the evidence fits who we think did the crime. Ms. Jensen 
suggested to you in her argument that Donald made up that he watched, uh, he wants to be a millionaire, whatever that show is. Well, let's think about it. Would it be hard for someone who has just learned their family had been brutally murdered, that they became the lead suspect, using your common sense, are you going to be thinking about what TV show you watched? You're not going to be thinking about what TV show you watched. You're going to have millions of thoughts going through your brain. And to latch in on, let me see now, at 633 days ago, this is a TV show I watched. I don't think that's reasonable. Later on, he came back, but keep in mind, he had just learned his family had been murdered. Let's see if I can make this work. <clears throat> Okay, now, the, Ms. Jensen said, who would use a credit card to get into a residence? Well, someone that doesn't want to be apprehended. In this particular case, we know that EMS used a credit card to get in the back door, and there was no damage to the door. Because you've seen pictures of the door, there was no damage to it. You have also heard witnesses say there was no damage to that door. Deputy Singleton was one of the initial deputies on the scene. The first deputy was uh, Deputy Smith and then Deputy Singleton. He testified that Donald Hartung was visibly upset upon learning that his family was deceased. Why is that important? It's important because during Donald's interview by Investigator Enfinger, Investigator Enfinger kept saying, well, you don't act, you're not acting right. You're not acting sad enough. Your emotions aren't right. I certainly hope that no one I know is ever going to have to go through the experience that Donald Hartung went through in learning that his three closest family members had been murdered. <coughs> but I can't tell you how anyone would react or should react to that kind of news. Do you become catatonic? Do you become hysterical? Do you keep it all inside? How, do, how is someone supposed to react? I don't think there's a textbook written on how you should react when your family is murdered. Yet, Donald's reaction didn't suit investigator Enfinger, so he made a big deal out of it. Another big deal that Investigator Enfinger made Ms. Jensen picked up on was a key. Donald didn't have a key to his family's residence. He doesn't live there. Why would he have a key? Other than Richard, nobody in the family travels. Usually you get a key to your family's residence if you're going to watch the house when they're out of town or if there's something like that that comes up. Three adults are living there. He didn't need a key. I don't, I'd suggest you that that is not unusual. It's maybe everybody has a key to the relative's house. I don't think that's true. I don't think it means that you're hor a horrible person if you don't have a key. Now, Donald willingly went with the de uh, investigator and thing. Let me see if I can fix that to answer questions. He was present when the deputies went into the house. In fact, when uh, Deputy Smith, who is now uh, with FDLE, Patrick Smith, came to Donald's house, he said, will you write out, or I'll write for you a, a consent to go in the house. Will you sign it? Donald readily signed it. No question about that. He's at the house. Deputy, Deputy Singleton says how upset he is. They put Donald in the police car because I think they said it was about 100, 105 degrees outside. And it was gonna, they knew it was going to be a while. So they put him in a car with the air conditioner on. While he's there, 
little dog runs out of the house, Bear, I believe it's called, and they put, Donald had already put him in his Lincoln. And a couple hours later, this happens around 9, 9.30, Deputy Infinger shows up at 12.30. He has Donald at the Sheriff's Department within an hour and starts questioning him. And when he questions him, Don, does Donald say, no, I don't want to go, there's no reason for me to go? He goes with him voluntarily. Within one hour of arriving at the scene, Deputy Infinger has Donald in an investigation interrogation room. They're not just rooms, they're interrogation rooms. If you look at the uh, pictures of this, they're handcuffs on the table. It's not just a friendly environment. Which button do I hit to show this? <coughs> show me for the next one. Where do I, where do I click okay. now? All right, be aware of them, okay? Thank you. Um, today's date is the 31st. Seventeen hundred West Leonard Street. All right, Donald. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you can, anything you say can be used as evidence against you in court. Look at you the have time. The right to have a lawyer present while being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, a lawyer will be appointed for you without cost before questioning. If you wish to answer questions now without a lawyer present. You'll still have the right to stop answering questions at any time. Uh, this paragraph below says, I have read the statement of my rights shown above, and I understand what my rights are. No promises or threats have been made to me, and no pressure of any kind has been used against me. Um, if you would like to read these again, and then I need you to... Let's do it this way. I need you to print your name here and then sign there. Note, there's no hesitation in doing that. And if you note, there is, if you see by Mr. Hartung's hand, there is, the handcuffs are right there. Voluntarily waived his rights. Okay. All right. Be aware of them, okay? Um, today's date is the 31st. Okay. They questioned Mr. Hartung until approximately 4.30 p.m. on that first interview. What the state gave you was an abbreviated interview of Mr. Hartung where they took out the gaps in time where Investigator Infinger left the room then he'd come back. He'd leave Mr. Hartung sometimes up to 10 minutes sitting in that room alone. So the entire interview initially took over three hours. Repeatedly, Mr. Hartung told Deputy Infinger, I didn't do it. Mr. Hartung, after waiving his rights to talk with the investigators, also voluntarily agreed to a DNA test, which was the buccal swab being taken. He also uh, was offered a lie detector test, which he agreed to. And if you recall the testimony from Investigator Infinger when I asked him, well, did you do the lie detector test? He said, well, no, it's not admissible. I said, well, you know the, both parties can agree to it. He said, yeah, but we couldn't find a polygraph examiner. This is on Friday at 1.30 at the Sheriff's Department. Now, there are polygraph examiners at Pensacola City Police Department. 
There are polygraph examiners at the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Department as well as at the Scambia County Sheriff's Department. This was an all hands on deck situation. Three murdered bodies discovered that day. In addition to the bodies, they called out all of the homicide investigators to investigate this case. Investigator Enfinger told you all, all the names. So everybody's on scene. They've got four crime scene uh, technicians that go out there. They have the coroner's uh, agents that go out there, Dr. Minyard's people. Everybody's out there, and they're saying they can't find a polygraph examiner. I'll suggest to you they didn't want one. Using your, I can't testify they didn't want one. That's not evidence. What is evidence is they wouldn't get one. Use your common sense about that. Why wouldn't you? If you think he is a suspect and you are keying in on him and he says, yes, I will give you a lie detector test. I'll be glad to give you a lie detector test. Why wouldn't they do it to take advantage of that? Because certainly if they had given him the test, he passed the test, maybe at that point they'd have looked for somebody else. Maybe they would have shifted their view. But had he passed that test, then potentially that would have blown the theory that he's the one we got. This is a big, high-profile case. Let's wrap it up fast. In addition to offering to do the lie detector test, he also agreed to have his house searched, which was done. Come on back up. <laughs> okay. Here we go with the buccal swab. You can also see how upset he is in this picture. I suggest you, although you were told in testimony that he didn't show any emotion, he's rubbing his eyes, got his head tucked down, appears to be crying. I suggest to you that is emotion. That is sadness.
want some more water? Uh, yeah, I could use a swallow. All right, no more. Mercy me. Now, why would someone who committed these murders do? This, I'm gonna find out. This. I know you will. You did it. I'm gonna find out and I'm gonna put your ass in jail. I would not harm my family, sir, for nothing in this world. You take a lie detector test? Yeah. I don't see why not. Take it right now? Yeah. Alright. Let me go see if I can find somebody to get me one. I don't see why not. In other words, I have nothing to hide. He says he'd like to get the hell out of here, but he stays there voluntarily. He's not under arrest at this point. The handcuffs have not put on him. He can leave at any time, but he stays. He stays to answer the questions that are asked of him by Investigator Enfinger. And you'll see at this point, it's 4.07 in the afternoon. He's been there since about 1.20. During the interviews, consistently, if you care to listen to him, you will hear that he loves his mother, he would not harm his brothers, and he says that over 20 times to Investigator Enfinger. Oh God, what am I going to do? <clears throat> this can be found on the disc that we introduced, or the thumb drive we introduced into evidence as exhibit number 26 for the defense. I would not harm my family for nothing in this world. That was repeated by him. He never asked for a lawyer doing the first interview that lasted over three hours and repeatedly told him, after investigator Enfinger repeatedly said, I know you killed your family. You killed your family. He was brutal to Mr. Hartung, trying to break him down after learning that his family had been murdered and Mr. Hartung acquiesced to every request, every request that Investigator Enfinger had for him. He said, yes, 
never said no, never said I want a lawyer, never said anything. He helped the investigation as best he could. Then, after being taken home, he was awakened at approximately 1 a.m., just a few hours after that first interview, and a second interview was held. And that was with uh, uh, Sergeant Coxwell of the Sheriff's Department. And in that interview, he again said, I did not kill my family. He's told the investigators, I love my family. I would not hurt them. He proudly talked about Richard. Look how proud he is talking about Richard. Junior high age. It's been like 13, 14. Yeah, that's what I think. I think it was about that age, yeah. Why didn't you try and win it if you were better? <laughs> well, I mean, I was better teaching him how to play. Once he learned how to play, he was better. <laughs> okay, I got you. Yeah. He was way better than me. I mean, I, I, I couldn't beat RT no more. Really? He was a great chess player. What else did he like to do? Um, sports wise? There you go. That's what he did. He willingly went there. He willingly waived his rights, willingly gave his buccal swab, offered to take the lie detector test, spoke of his, and in the beginning of this, if you were to look at it, he speaks of his family in the present tense, not as if they were dead. Had he murdered his family on Tuesday and known they were dead, he in all likelihood would have talked of them in the past tense. He talks about his family in the present tense during that interview. He went back, he went the first time for a voluntary, voluntary interview, he went the second time signed his rights waiver immediately, answered all questions without hesitation, because he's telling the truth. In the second interview, when he went back voluntarily, he praised his family, shows emotion, which was cut out of the state's version, and his answers remained the same through both interviews. And the reason they remain the same is he's telling the truth. He told investigator Enfinger when he was attacked about the way he showed emotion, I got my way of handling things, I hold it inside. This is at the second interview, 2.30 in the morning on August 1st. Now, 
This goes to the crime scene. I'll get to that in a moment. You heard the interview of Mr. Hartung where Sergeant Coxwell and Investigator Enfinger talk about him being a Wiccan. And they tell him, we know you killed your family because it was a Wiccan ritual. It was the blue moon. You put the bodies in a, uh, a sacrificial way. You covered them up. And they're telling Mr. Hartung, this is all ritual killing. The state initially in their opening said, this isn't ritual killing. This is a killing for uh, money. That's why Donald killed his family. He killed them for money. Well, the truth of the matter is, other than the fact he didn't kill his family, we had to put on a witness to debunk that. That didn't, if the state wasn't relying on this Wiccan killing theory, why did they show it to you? Why'd they introduce it? They didn't have to introduce it. They cut, a lot, cut out a lot on the uh, video that we're showing you now, but why would they put it in? I suggest to you they put it in to try to offend you, get you upset. Any prior reference to the state's motivation? There is no basis to believe that this murder had anything to do with Wicca. We put on Dr. Larson. And keep in mind, the state doesn't have to put any witnesses on. We put on Dr. Larson to explain to you, and I hope he did a good job of it, of what the Wicca religion is and the fact that none of, that Wiccans do not murder people. The blue moon doesn't have any greater significance than any other full moon. And the fact that the bodies were not put in any ceremonial fashion. There was nothing, there is nothing in the Wicca religion that has to do with sacrifices of animals, sacrifices of people. That that is absolutely ridiculous. And I would ask you to totally disregard that line of questioning from Investigator Enfinger and Sergeant Coxwell. Now, the investigation of Donald's residence. When his residence was searched, initially they thought there was blood in the residence, and that was taken to the lab, and you heard Ms. Wilkerson from FDLE testify that there was no blood on any of the items from Donald's house. There was nothing found in Donald's house that would in any way connect him or link him to any crime. It has been suggested to you that Donald murdered his family to get to their money. And Ms. Jensen put on a on her PowerPoint, a list of the assets that Von Seal Smith had, Richard had, and John had. And it came up to 800 something thousand dollars. Apparently the state got this during a search of the house. And one thing you should note, there is no evidence Donald Hartung knew about those figures no evidence whatsoever. On the documents that the state had 
to establish those figures. There's no evidence that Mr. Hartung's fingerprints or DNA were on any of those pieces of paper that gave those figures. So how could the state suggest to you that he knew what the assets were for each brother and for his mother? No evidence of that whatsoever. As I suggested to you in my opening statement, there would never be any evidence that Donald saw the will, knew of the will, read the will, or knew of its contents. The only indication you may have that Donald knew of the contents of the will would be based on what Purifoy, the jailhouse informant, testified to. Now, keep in mind, Purifoy has worked the system for a long time. He worked the system to get out of a federal court sentence. He has six or seven convictions, plus one for dishonesty. And he cut a great deal for himself by testifying. He was facing a mandatory life sentence that was reduced to 30 years. And that's before he testifies. That's just for talking to the state he got that huge benefit. Because in Florida, if you have a life sentence, you die in prison. That's it. You're dead. You're in prison. You die there. He cut the deal to get rid of that life sentence and get himself down to 30 years. But he's got a kicker. If he comes to court, and testifies well, what's his kicker? The state can ask the court to reduce his sentence even more. So he had every, every incentive in the world to come up here and spin a tail. How would he know these facts? Well, during the course of this trial, I think you've seen both the state and the defense rifling through numerous documents, files piled all over here. That, a lot of that's what's called discovery documents. In Florida, the state has to provide to the defense basically all of their evidence. The defense has an equal obligation to the state. It's called open discovery. Well, my client sitting in jail isn't sitting in a vacuum. We have to communicate with him. We have to share with him what evidence the state has. We have to share with him by letter, by mail, all of these facts. And you heard that in prison cells or jail cells, Folks don't have lockers or places they can keep their, th their items secured. How easy is it to rifle through someone's documents when they're out of their cell? They're in court, for instance. You have all the time in the world to rifle through their documents. There's a probate involved in this case. And if you remember um, the young lady who now works for the Levin Papantonio law firm was here. She worked for the probate attorney when the uh, floor safe was found. And she indicated that they would communicate with Mr. Hartung. She didn't work there for a long time, so she couldn't say what was communicated to him, but they also communicated to him. And that floor safe information would have been communicated to him because it potentially is an asset of the, of the estate. So that's how Purify, Purifoy would know all of this. Now, Mr. Roddenberry came in, and he talked about the will. And then I called him back be, to ask him specifically if R.T., Richard, or John had wills, then their money would go to whomever they designated as their beneficiary. 
It so happened that apparently neither one of them had a will. But there's no evidence that Donald knew that, no evidence whatsoever. And there's no evidence other than Purifoy that Donald had any inkling of the will. The will is obviously a major piece of evidence and was provided to Donald when it was provided to the state, it was also provided to Donald. So, where is Donald Hartung's motive? We've ruled out this blue moon nonsense. And other than Purifoy, we've ruled out any way that Donald could have known about the will. In Investigator Enfinger said that he got the will from family members. Was there any indication that Donald's DNA or fingerprints were on the will? There's none. There's no evidence to that. And as long as we're talking about this, let's talk about that safe in the floor. The picture of the safe in the floor shows that the carpet was cut out. Christine Rollins, the crime scene tech who took all the photographs, said she never got there and never took any pictures of it, didn't know about the safe. Investor Enfinger didn't know about the safe. RT had a safe in his room, and if you remember, it was propped open or semi-open with all that cash in there. Ms. Jensen showed you some numbers on a piece of paper that uh, Donald had at his house, apparently. Those numbers didn't match any of those safes. If, they, if those numbers had matched those safes, don't you think you'd have heard about it? Investigator Enfinger, one of the other investigators would certainly have said, yes, we found these numbers at Donald's house, and lo and behold, when we spun the combination, they matched. You never heard that testimony because those numbers had nothing to do with those safes. Now, I suggested to you in my opening statement that you would never hear any testimony that Donald had a temper, that Donald would go into rages, or anything such as that. And you never heard that testimony. The worst testimony you heard from, was from Donald's estranged son who said that his dad was the black sheep. If you look at his testimony, why would Donald have been the black sheep? Because when he was married to his son's mother, there were occasions when he went against his mother, and those occasions were when he first married, you heard Donald Jr. say that Von Seal didn't like Donald's wife. And there was a split in the family over that because he sided with his wife. The second time was after John apparently exposed himself to Donald Jr. And Von Seal was very upset by that. My client, Donald, sided with his wife again. He stuck up for his wife against his mother. Now, I don't think that makes a murderer. I think that might make a pretty good husband. But that doesn't make a murderer. And that's why he was the black sheep, because he stuck up for his wife when his, when his mother didn't like her, didn't want him to marry her, didn't want anything to do with her. That is not a basis for murder, just that you stick up for your wife. That were the case, probably thousands of men in this area would be accused of murder. Because men generally stick up for their wives. Other than that, 
there's nothing that Donald Jr. really had to say, and I'll suggest to you that if he could have said that my dad had a bad temper, my dad was an angry man, my dad would be physically abusive, that would have come out. But it didn't come out because there's no proof that Donald in any way is a violent individual. Donald's letter of resignation, apparently that's a big deal. Donald worked for G4S security as a security guard at Sacred Heart Hospital. His family has just been brutally murdered. He is the suspect, and he resigns from work. Resigned from work before he was fired because he was a suspect. Did he resign from work because the pressures are so great with his family being murdered? There's no way of knowing that. But it's not because he was going to inherit a bunch of money. There's no indication of that. That's fanciful thinking. But it's reasonable to think that when your family's been brutally murdered, that that might be all-consuming to you, especially if you've been accused of doing that murder and you know you're not guilty of it. Pretty hard to keep your mind on your job. The deposit slips the state introduced, uh, two of them, I think one was for $100, the other was for about $800. People have savings. People deposit money in their banks. And that happened after the calls to the bank. There's no indication that any of that money was from the, uh, the murder scene. In fact, if he needed money so badly, why leave 13 plus thousand dollars in a safe in Richard's room? Nobody would know about it. Why not just take it? No one would have a clue that that money was gone. Here's a real question. Why was Richard's safe left open and that money in there? Was somebody in that safe looking for something other than money? He did work for Homeland Security in the computer division. We don't know what he did, but we can wonder why would they go in there? Why were his keys taken? Why was there foreign DNA in the front pocket of Richard's? All those are unanswered questions. I don't have an answer for them, but they are unanswered questions. Could that have been what led to the murder of these people? I don't know the answer to that. I'm not going to try to tell you the answer to that. But it's something you can certainly consider. Why did DHS fly in two investigators, one from Texas and one from Miami? The Sheriff's Department apparently was doing a pretty good job from what you would think, I don't think they did a good job because I don't think they looked at any of the evidence and certainly didn't look at anybody but Donald. But why would they fly them in? Then why would they take all the electronics, not just the DHS electronics, but take all the electronics and send them to the Secret Service in Jacksonville and also up to DHS in D.C.? We have the department... I understand with the DHS computer. That makes sense to me because it's federal and the federals are different than the rest of us. But why for the state stuff? We have a fairly competent Florida Department of Law Enforcement lab that can get into all this stuff. Why did they take it all? And the one computer, the, 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 they couldn't get into the Apple devices, which may or may not be unusual because I know there's a lot of controversy with Apple and trying to get in the back door on those. But on the DHS computer, they said they couldn't get in, but there was a software glitch. I suggest to you we really don't know what was in that computer, if there was a software glitch or not. This is DHS, remember. And although they told the Scambi County Sheriff's officers nothing in the computers of interest and that this case is not connected to us, 
There was also no report issued by DHS to the Escambia County. Check the state as to Members of the jury, you are to disregard any reference to the existence or non-existence of any supposed DHS report. One must wonder why was DHS investigators up here for two weeks? We know that Richard was a GS-14 team leader. He was on call 24-7 and was some type of computer specialist. Now, let's go to the crime scene. At the crime scene, it was suggested to you that that thermostat showed 89, 86 degrees. Doors propped open. You can see the, the storm door there is propped open and the uh, entry door is propped open. The temperature outside was around 100, 105 degrees. It is common sense that that thermostat would jack up with the door being open with that kind of heat. There is a, um, there was a dog food bowl in the kitchen. You can see it right there. And there's a thermostat in the hallway that reads 76 degrees. Now, let's go to the dog. The dog was running around the house, is what the testimony was. The, uh, Dr. Minyard said the dog had not eaten, nibbled on, or in any way attacked the bodies. Dr. Arden said the same thing based upon his reviewing the report. If the dog wasn't doing that, I suggest to you, there must have been food in the house for the dog to eat if you're to believe that there was no one there to feed the dog for three days. Dog food bowl that you saw was full, water bowl full. There's no indication there was any other food source other than that bowl and that bowl of water. How is it that you have a dog in the house running around for three days, it's not going to eat and it's not going to drink? Somebody was there giving the dog food and water. We don't know who, we don't know when it was given to the dog, but it was certainly given to the dog or it wouldn't have been full. I believe that would, when you go back to the jury room, that would be state's exhibit I think it's 60, States Exhibit 60. So look at that. Keeping in mind that Mr. Chittenden said nobody was at that house after Tuesday. Nobody entered or left the house. But we know that the dog's not gonna not eat or drink for three days. Who filled up the dog's bowl who filled for food and who filled up the water bowl. I don't have an answer to that. I'm not going to fictionalize this and tell you, but somebody did. That's using your common sense.
now. In the interview with Donald on that first, I believe it was the first interview, one of the things Investigator Enfinger did was looked at Donald's hands. What's the importance of that? The importance of that is to see if there's any marks on his hands. You heard, them, you heard testimony that RT's hands had defensive wounds on them. There are no marks on Donald's hands. If he had been in a tussle, a fight, or anything else with RT, he would have had wounds on his hands. There was no DNA from Donald on RT or on John or on Von Seal. One thing that uh, Christine Rollins was called back about was whether or not she changed gloves in gathering evidence. Her answer was, no, I didn't change gloves for every piece of evidence. Mr. Myers asked her, well, did you change them after you touched something bloody? The answer was yes. But as we know from listening to Ms. Wilkerson and from Ms. Zilliger, who we called, you don't always know if there's DNA. The skin cell DNA, you can't see it. Sure, you know if there's blood that there's DNA, but there's something called transference that we all were educated on, and in not changing your gloves, collecting various pieces of evidence, then there is transference. Is it a lot of transference, a little bit of transference? Nobody knows, but it is there, and that is bad crime scene work. Then we get to the trash can. As Mr. Waller had suggested, why not unload the contents of the trash can on the scene with Ms. Eliopoulos, who was also a crime scene tech there. Ms. Eliopoulos was doing video recording. So she could have video recorded each layer of the trash can and video recorded what was being taken out and the order it was being taken out in. Let's see. There's the trash can. Now, one thing that's interesting, in the trash can, there are cameras. Uh, and the cameras are up there by the head of that goose. Donald's DNA nor fingerprints were on the trash cans. OK, this cigarette butt that you've heard about that had blood on it. There's a cigarette butt right up there, if you can see it. Anyway, you can see the cigarette butt at the top of the track of the uh, cup. There it is again. That's a French fry. Back it up. You'll see on the top of the cup is a French fry right there, right? And then right below the French fry is a cigarette butt. And that's one picture. This is at the uh, crime scene lab that uh, Ms. Rollins testified was not sterile, so being in a sterile environment, they could have done this at the house. But you'll see that cigarette butt up there next to the French fry. Now, okay. the cigarette butt, People move my stuff around, I can't ever find it. Okay, if I back up, we've got the cigarette butt right there and the french fry right there. 
Now we've got the french fry here, but the cigarette butt is here. That's how it got bloody, and that's how it ended up in the bloody rags. You go from here, cigarette butt and the fry, to here with the fry, no cigarette butt because it's fallen down here during the unloading of the trash can. There's the purse. There was a great deal made out, out of the fact that Donald's DNA was on the latch part of his mom's purse, that flap that goes over. There's also in here, there, well, I don't have the picture of it, but there was a brown purse also in the trash. Richard's DNA was on that brown purse. Does that mean that Richard did something wrong because his DNA is on a brown purse? No, there's, Donald could easily have just gone in his mom's purse to get something for her. There's no way of knowing why his DNA would have been on it, but I don't think it's unusual to suggest that a son might go in their mom's purse if they're asked to get something out. Why would Richard's DNA be on the brown purse? Same reason. There's nothing nefarious about that at all. There it is right there, and I believe the testimony was that on the outside of that flap is where the DNA was. Now, let's go to the checkbook. Okay. These were all the, some of the items, or all the items that were in this Swiss Army notebook. Kleenex, all these letters, this down here, and the checkbook. I asked Ms. Wilkerson about any of this. Donald's DNA was not there. Not here, not on any of this. On the front check, I asked, is Donald's DNA in there? No. Where was his DNA? On the outside of the checkbook. That's where it was. No way of knowing when it was there, how long it was there. One of the problems in cases like this, or in many cases, you have people's patterns of behavior. I always put this in this pocket when I'm in trial. Obviously, I didn't have it done today because I couldn't find it. People break habits of behavior. It's, just, it's normal. We're not all perfect. We don't all, although a lot of us try to do things in the same way every time, it doesn't always happen. You make mistakes. You forget things. Could Richard have left his checkbook at home on the dining table and Donald moved it one day and gotten his DNA all over it? Sure he could have. The fact that his DNA is on that checkbook doesn't mean that he's a killer. The truth of the matter is, if he had rifled that pouch, his DNA would have been on these other things as well. And the testimony from Ms. Wilkerson, and again, if, you're, if your notes, your, te your memory is different than mine or the state's, rely on yours, because you are the jury. But my memory of it is that Ms. Wilkerson said that Donald Hartung's DNA was not on any pouch in the notebook and was on no item but the checkbook. And had he rifled it, his DNA would have been in the pouch, would have been on one of those other items. That's the purse that Richard's DNA was on that was also in the trash can. Now, Mr. Chittenden said 
that Zena the dog was not with Mr. Hartum when he pulled up because he couldn't see the dog. A lot of people will drive around with their dogs and what the dogs do besides sit up and hang their head out the window. They'll lay down on the seat. If the dog's laying down on the seat, you're not going to see the dog. Again, in cases like this, the slightest deviation, the fact that most of the time the dog's sitting up, this time the dog may have been laying down. Well, that becomes a huge lie. Uh, he's got to be lying because Mr. Chitton didn't, didn't see the dog. Well, he might not have seen the dog because the dog was lying down. And as intrusive as Mr. Chitton may be in staring at his neighbors, He's not perfect. He may not have seen the dog out back. That doesn't mean in 105 degree, 100 degree weather, the dog wasn't laying against the house or under a tree. And as far as his timeline's concerned, I can't tell you that he's lying. I don't think he's lying. I think he could be mistaken. Everyone is not perfect. Everyone is not exact. Now, David Flat, he was a DHS friend of uh, Richard Thomas. If you all remember his testimony, he's the one that talked about Richard keeping the black case with him at work or in a side uh, pocket. He also went on to say that RT didn't like Donald and would stay late on Tuesdays. Didn't say Donald was violent, didn't say anything like that, just said he didn't like his brother. Brotherly disputes, who knows? But not liking somebody is not grounds to be murdered. However, we then go to Tammy Duncan, who is the female a uh, DHS worker who texts with Richard all the time, spends a lot of time with him. What she said was that Richard would, would get mad at Donald because Donald talked during TV shows and during football games. And Richard liked to quiet when he watched TV and quiet when he watched football games. And Donald would talk. Well, that may have been upsetting, but I don't know that that brings you to the level of hating your brother. And you all saw how proud Donald was of RT. Now, Tammy also went on to explain this statement by Mr. Flat about Richard working late on Tuesday. Keep in mind, he worked at DHS. He was on call 24-7. The only day that Richard could stay late was on Tuesday. And the reason was he did not have to pick John up from work and Donald went there to cook dinner. He didn't have to cook dinner. That gave him the luxury of working late. She also said, she being Ms. Duncan, that on Wednesdays he would work later than normal but he would have to leave to cook dinner for his mother. He cooked dinner for them. But he, could ha he had a luxury on Tuesday of being able to stay late, get his work done, because he knew he didn't have to pick John up from work and that Donald was cooking dinner for Mama. But you see how things can be twisted to say, well, he doesn't want to be around his brother. No, he was there because that was the only chance he had to work late. And on Wednesday, he stayed a little later because of not having to pick John up, but he still have to leave to go home to cook dinner. You know, you heard, I'll go back to Mr. Purifoy for a minute because I just looked at one of my notes. The only person 
the state could bring or brought from being in this jail cell to testify against my client was Purifoy, the opportunist. Nobody else came to testify. Of all the people that are in and out of that jail, of all the people in those cells, the state found one person to testify that they brought before you. And the person they brought before you is working an angle. And I suggest to you that he is absolutely unbelievable. Wayne Wright, he came in here and testified that he found a high priest. I said, well, did he ride a Harley like Purifoy said? I don't know. They didn't know Donald Hartung. And I'm sure that being a seasoned investigator, Mr. Wright didn't say, we want to know about the $15,000 that Donald Hartung gave you. He would have done it much more subtly than that. But these people didn't know Donald Hartung. There was no connection to Donald Hartung, no connection that could have been developed between them and Donald Hartung. I don't have any idea how Purefoy, Purefoy would know about any Wiccan priest on, uh, I believe it was Nine Mile Road, but there was no connection to Donald Hartung. Let's talk about Mark Bailey. Mark Bailey was a co-worker, worked with Donald for about five, five and a half years. A couple occasions he asked Donald to go shooting, and Donald said, no, nah, I don't want to go. They would talk about guns occasionally. Nothing wrong with that. A lot of guys do that. He told Mr. Bailey that his mom favored him. He thought he was in good graces with his mom. He told him that RT was gone a lot and then said, if anything happens to my mama, he didn't say, I'll get all the money. He said, my share, I would like to retire. Didn't say, I'm getting all the money. He said, on my share of it, anticipating that he would be a third, a third, a third. And both Mr. Bailey and Donald complained about their pay, but who doesn't comp complain about their pay at some point? And he said that Donald uh, was complaining about the, um, the money that he'd have to spend on getting his car fixed. Well, again, I don't know who doesn't complain if you have to get your car fixed. It seems that prices go up and up and up, and it's just an annoyance. Big deal was made about Donald living on his own. He's lived in that rental house for 15 years. You've seen pictures of the rental house. Donald didn't live in the hoarder's mess that his mama lived in. That might be a real good reason to want, not want to live there. Also, he moved down here after he was divorced. And there was no room at the house at that time because his dad was alive and RT and John were already living there with his mother. And at the point in time that his dad died, which was about three years before this murder took place, he'd already been there for 12 years. He was happy being there. There was no reason to move. So I don't think you can make anything in that. Plus the fact that it seems normal to me for a 50-plus-year-old man to want to live in his, on his own, not live with his mama. Now, on the police work, the drains were seized, never checked. No log of who goes in and out on the time. After the search, two knives were found. Crime scene uh, technicians never changed, did not change gloves during evidence collection except if there was something bloody. 
we don't have any evidence of if the thermostats were checked or when. And you saw on the one picture the back door was left propped open. I don't know how long that was left propped open. Was it for that photo or had it been propped open all day? On the Swiss Army case, that's, we talked about the contents. On the exterior of it, on one of the tabs or both of the tabs, Donald's DNA was found. Was that transfer DNA or did he pick it up and move it? You saw, and you can see pictures of that kitchen. If you're cooking that kitchen, if something's left there, you're gonna have to move something or touch something. And in one of the pictures, it's up against the hammer and other items. So was that transfer DNA or Donald's DNA on those zippers? We do not know. But we know that his DNA was on the checkbook, but nowhere else in that, in that case. We don't know when the last check was written in that checkbook or how long it had Donald's DNA on and how long it had been sitting in the case. Now, I'm not going to go over Dr. Larson. I've already touched on him and touched on Mr. Wheeler. But let's talk about Dr. Arden. Dr. Arden's the chairman of the group of board certified pathologists, one of only 500 in the country. He talked about the time of death, and as a forensic pathologist, he said you absolutely need to take the human factors into consideration. No question about that. But he also said that the scientific issues don't lie. On the liver mortis, he said that really wasn't applicable to this, but the rigor mortis is. And if you recall Dr. Minyard's testimony, 12 hours for it to set in, 12 hours for it to be there, and then 12 hours for it to dissipate. That's 36 hours. At the time that the coroner's people got to the crime scene and they checked it out, this was around 5 o'clock, the bodies were just very slight rigor mortis, and by 9 o'clock on the 1st of August, when Dr. Minyard started the autopsies, there was no rigor mortis there at all. You can do the math back up 36 hours from 5 o'clock on the 31st to when the rigor mortis would set in, and it starts to set in right away. Now. When the morgue people did not take the liver temperature of Mrs. Smith, but they did of John and RT. John's was 83.9 degrees and RT's was 82.6 degrees, 15 to 16 degrees below normal. As Dr. Arden testified, this is science. The generally considered rate of cooling of the body is one and a half degrees per hour. If you took that figure, you'd be 10 to 11 hours back that the bodies were killed. But he said that figure would be for people in good shape, under perfect conditions. That's not what we have here. So he dropped it down. He took a third off of that figure, putting it down to one degree per hour. That puts the bodies being killed 15 to 16 hours earlier. 
Then he said, well, let's take it down again because the bodies were covered up. He took it down to losing three quarters of a degree an hour. That is half of what the normal body would lose. And on that figure, at half what the normal body would lose, he backed it up to 20 to 22 hours prior to the temperatures being taken. And he said, we'll go better than that. Let's drop it down to a half a degree. That's taking a full degree off, well over 70%. And at that, it figures out to being 32 hours ago. And 32 hours would put it very, very late Tuesday night or, very, or in the early morning of Wednesday. None of that science ties in to the time of death that if Donald Hartung murdered his family. It doesn't work however you look at it. We're not telling you, I'm not suggesting to you, that this family wasn't brutally murdered. They obviously were. I'm telling you that the science does not support in any way the state's contention that Donald Hartung murdered his family. Throw out everything I've said. Throw everything out and just look at Dr. Arden's testimony. And if you look at the scientific testimony, that, that science, if you look at that, my client did not kill his family. Who killed his family? I don't know that. That's not what your job is as jurors, or my job is, is to come in with the smoking gun and say, this is the person that did it. We don't know. Maybe if there were other suspects developed, we would know. And Donald wouldn't have had this five-year nightmare. But we don't know, but we do know what the science is. And the science is concrete. So you've got anywhere between, at the latest, Tuesday night late, up to 10 to 11 hours, which Dr. Arden said he wouldn't go with but he could go with the 20 to 22 hours, which again puts it outside of the range of Donald Hartung in any way, shape, form, or manner. Remember, Ms. Jensen said I was gonna make a big deal out of the credit card. I'm not making a big deal out of it, but if somebody wanted to burgle that house, get in and murder these people, get whatever they wanted to get out of the house. It obviously wasn't money because $13,000 plus was left. There is an easy way to get in the house, a credit card. That's it. Was Donald Hartung's DNA on the back of Richard's belt? there was a trace amount of his DNA on the back of Richard's belt. Could that have gotten there from transfer DNA? Absolutely, it wasn't a full profile. But again, all these little things the state's using to try to build their case against Mr. Hartung, but that all flies in the face of science. Now, you are going to go back into that jury room after Ms. Jensen gets a second chance to talk to you and tell you maybe why I'm wrong or why she's right. We're lawyers, we're up here arguing our position or trying to present facts to you. But when you're back there in that jury room, if you believe my client is probably guilty, maybe guilty, possibly guilty, that means you come back with a verdict of not guilty. You are not here as investigators to determine who committed the crime, 
You're not vigilantes to avenge the murders of these people, but you're here to rationally evaluate the evidence, talk about the evidence, talk about the lack of evidence, talk about a conflict in the evidence to come up with your decision. Now, you're going to have jury instructions read to you by the judge, and part of one of the jury instructions is called reasonable doubt burden of proof. If after carefully considering, comparing, and weighing all of the evidence, there is not an abiding conviction of guilt, or if having a conviction, it is one which is not stable, but one which wavers and vacillates, then the charge is not proved beyond every reasonable doubt, and you must find the defendant not guilty because the doubt is reasonable. Now, the doubt is not to be speculative, imaginary, or forced. That cannot have you bring back a not guilty verdict. But if it is one that is not abiding or one that is not stable but wavers and vacillates, then it is your duty to return a verdict of not guilty. There's another called weighing the evidence. Has the witness been offered or received any money, preferred treatment, or other benefit in order to get the witness to testify? That goes to Mr. Purifoy. Now, Mr. Myers asked my witnesses if they'd been paid and how much. They were all paid to come here. They don't work for free. They're paid through the Judicial Administration Commission. Florida, the state of Florida, is paying those witnesses just like they pay the prosecutors, just like they pay Ms. Wilkerson, uh, Investigator Enfinger. Everybody gets paid for their work, and these people are no different. They fly down here, and they testified. <coughs> the court's further going to tell you, you must consider the testimony of some witnesses with more caution than others. For example, a witness who hopes to gain more favorable treatment in his or her own case may have a reason to make a false statement in order to strike a good bargain with the state. That applies to Mr. Purifoy 100%. Now, you're gonna, I'm leaving now, so you can be relieved of that anyway. But each one of you, when you go back to that jury room, must, at the end of this case, you must individually live with your verdict. That verdict will stay with you forever. And I'm asking you, please do not be bullied, harassed, or forced by another juror to change your vote. I don't care what your vote is. It is your obligation to discuss with each juror the facts of this case, the evidence, lack of evidence, or conflict in the evidence. After you do that, each one of you must Stay with what you believe to be true. Do not allow another juror to bully you. This is, you are sitting on the most serious and solemn cases that we have in the, judici in the judicial system. And your verdict is incredibly important to the integrity of the system. And I ask you to consider all of the evidence, and after considering that evidence, to return a verdict of not guilty for each count of the indictment. Thank you. Ms. Jensen. 